The story everybody is talking about this past week is the Morrison government's surprise announcement about AUKUS, A-U-K-U-S, Australia's new nuclear submarine agreement with the US and the United Kingdom. Not content with denying climate change, mangling gender and equity issues, giving the country's money away to billionaires, killing renewables and spending billions on nuclear subs while half the country goes broke in lockdown, now the Morrison government wants to bring uranium back into the mix as well. Now, AUKUS has reignited fierce debate in Australia, indeed the entire Pacific region, about all things nuclear, our obligations under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and, of course, what to do about China. To help make sense of it all, we are joined today by Professor Mark Beeson. Mark is Professor of International Politics at the University of Western Australia and founding editor of Critical Studies of the Asia Pacific. He is Research Chair of the Australian Institute of International Affairs and an expert on international relations and foreign policy, particularly in the Asia-Pacific. Professor Beeson, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Now, the AUKUS deal seems aimed squarely at China, particularly their activities in the South China Sea. Um, when announcing it, Scott Morrison is quoted as saying, and I quote, the relatively benign environment we have enjoyed in many decades in our region is behind us. And he further added, we have entered, no doubt, a new era. I'm sure there's general agreement on that. Professor Beeson, you're an expert on Asia-Pacific relations, and you know better than most the real-world impact these kinds of announcements have when dealing with an aggressive superpower like China. How, how do you think this went down in Beijing? Where do you think the August announcement rates with Beijing in terms of further enraging China? And where do you think Australia-China relations will go from here? Okay. Well, I think, uh, predictably enough, China wasn't very impressed with this announcement because I think it fulfills their view of Australia's relationship with the region and with the United States in particular. I think there's an assumption in Beijing that uh, the Australia is something of a, a predictable ally of the United States and basically it does what the United States wants it to do. And this particular development, I think, is... Uh, the culmination of a series of uh, recent developments, uh, the long-term standing relationship between the United States uh, and Australia as close allies. But that was also built upon with the inauguration of the quadrilateral dialogue uh, mechanism, which includes, uh, as in, in addition to Australia and the United States, also Japan and India. And I don't think China was very happy about that. So when AUKUS was announced... I think many people in Beijing saw this as uh, another step in the road to attempting to contain China, even though people don't actually use that language. I think there's not much doubt that that's what's going on here and that it is a sort of calculated way of trying to solidify particular alliance relationships in an effort to uh, curb uh, China's influence in the region. So as far as Australia's uh, relationship with China goes, I mean, it's going to further poison the relationship, I think, and make it more difficult and complicated, because uh, there's not a lot of room to manoeuvre now, I don't think, as far as Australia is concerned, uh, as an independent actor. And this will also confirm many of the kind of uh, stereotypical prejudices that exist in Beijing as well. But if you think about it from Beijing's perspective, they see themselves, rightly or wrongly, as being surrounded by potentially hostile or unfriendly powers and with uh, American bases quite close to their territory. So from, a, from the perspective of Beijing, this is, looks like a pretty unfriendly sort of gesture. And the fact that Australia is once again in the forefront of promoting this kind of uh, relationship or set of alliances is also going to make life pretty difficult, I think, uh, for Canberra and Beijing to improve the relationship. I certainly will. So where do you think, it's pretty obvious what the military strategic implications are of the August deal. What do you think in the shorter term that does to our trade relationship with China, which has already gone a little cold after the COVID comments? It certainly has. And uh, I think the problem for Australia is concerned. On the one hand, we're very reliant on China. Something like 40% of our total exports go to China. So we're hugely dependent on them. 
uh, as are many other countries in the region. But I think the particular vulnerability is that China's demonstrated that it's prepared to switch off and switch on this kind of economic relationship as it sees fit. And it can do that to Australia quite easily in, in many ways. I mean, it does need iron ore and it wants to get it from somewhere. So that's a, a sort of a, a bit of interdependence that Australia benefits from in many ways. But I think as far as Australia is concerned, from a, the perspective of Beijing, it's a sort of easy country to punish in some ways and to make an example of. Uh, that if you don't, uh, if you're not friendly towards China, they can do things to you and hurt you. And people now talk about China's geoeconomic power and leverage uh, over uh, its trading partners, who it's always the largest trading partner in the relationship. So it does have this potential leverage that it can exploit and it can hurt Australian exporters to China. And this makes the whole business of trying to work out how to deal with China in the longer term at an economic level and a strategic level simultaneously. It's an extremely difficult uh, set of relationships to balance, but I think the Morrison government in particular has gone out on a bit of a limb strategically and been prioritising that aspect of the relationship at the cost of the economic relationship, I think. Speaking of relationships, Australia has also managed to enrage France, good and proper with the announcement, ditching the $90 billion existing submarine deal with them without telling them first. At the same time, there seems to be some general agreement, including such as from people like Senator Rex Patrick, who's an ex-Navy man himself, that the French deal wasn't the best thing for the buck to start with and that in any case maybe Australia should have cut and run when it came to that. Notwithstanding... The break fees on a contract like the 90 billion with the French would have to be in the hundreds of millions. What do you make of the French connection now? Where do you think this is going, especially now that they've already called their ambassadors over it? Indeed. I mean, some people think that the recalling ambassadors was a bit of an overreaction, and uh, but I think it demonstrates how unhappy France is because it's a tremendous loss of face for the uh, Macron government in particular, and there's a French election coming up in the near future. And this doesn't play very well domestically in France. I don't think there's any doubt about that at all. But I think there's a bit of history, of course, in all of this as well. And uh, the idea that the so-called Anglosphere nations are getting together again, Britain, uh, the United States and Australia, and that they have closer ties, that they have uh, longer term connections than anybody does with France, and that France is interests and views are going to be overridden when it suits the Anglosphere countries to do so. I think that also feeds into a whole series of long-standing views that the French have had about some of that, you know, particularly in the wake of Brexit and other things as well. So there's, there's a bit of history there as well, which won't be easy to overcome. Uh, I believe that Biden's supposed to be ringing up Macron the next day or two and trying to placate the French, but that won't mm. be easy. And I think the the depth of national feeling and outrage in France over the way this was handled and the way that it was kind of dropped upon them suddenly without any kind of real prior notice. I think the the optics are not good in all of this and the diplomatic uh, finessing of this particular problem wasn't well done at all, I think. And uh, and uh, the I think the French understandably think that the uh, Australians have been less than forthright and frank in the way that they've handled this relationship. And I think the longer term problem for Australia is they were trying to encourage uh, France in particular and the European Union uh, more generally to take a greater interest in the so-called Indo-Pacific region. Uh, and France has got major interests in this part of the world. And mm. so they would have been potentially an important ally, possibly, or collaborator in uh, a, a wider set of relationships, again, that have got China as part in the in part of the rationale for having those relationships. But I think those kinds of things are uh, somewhat in doubt now. It, it will depend on how France uh, responds to this in the long term. So that's a strategic aspect of all of this. But at the same time, Australia was thinking about trying to get a new uh, free trade agreement with the European Union, which relies on consensus amongst the European Union members. And if France is still uh, not happy with Australia, this could be one way of demonstrating that in a way that would actually hurt uh, Australia's uh, trading uh, interests and would be particularly damaging if it's also uh, 
uh, not getting on very well with its principal trade partner, China. So Australia's uh, economic options are becoming increasingly restricted because they are playing second fiddle to the, the wider strategic uh, rationale for Australia's changing security policies. And I think that's always been the case, and it's not entirely surprising. Uh, I think what is surprising is that the, uh, the Labour Party, for example, in Australia, has also given support to this uh, initiative, despite not really being in the loop while it was being negotiated. And there, there aren't many alternative ideas about what a different set of strategic relationships might look like. Mm -hmm. There's not much uh, thought given to the sorts of creative diplomacy that a so-called middle power like Australia might be able to play in the region, uh, because uh, I would argue for what it's worth that if Australia is going to be a genuinely independent foreign policy actor in the region, then it's in Australia's interest and the interests of other sort of middle powers around the region to encourage both China and the United States to abide by the rules, to not throw their weight around, to not ramp up strategic tensions in the region and you know risk the uh, possibility of outright conflict in the region. But those kinds of ideas don't get much of a look in or aren't taken terribly seriously in strategic discussions in places like Canberra and Washington, unfortunately, or Beijing for that matter. Indeed. Speaking of historic strategic alliances, I'd like to hear your views on how this impacts on our ANZAC friends across the ditch in New Zealand. Jacinda Ardern has already said in keeping with their long-term no nuclear policy, no nuclear-powered subs will be allowed in New Zealand waters, whether they're Australian or not, given our relationship with them and our obligations under the 1951 ANZUS Treaty. How do you see that particular argument ending? Well, I think New Zealand's a really interesting country in many ways, and uh, the existing ANZUS relationship uh, doesn't really exist in the way that it does because New Zealand's effectively not been a partner or member of it for a long time now because mm. of its uh, anti-nuclear policy. But the interesting thing about New Zealand is they've kind of recognised that they're a small country with limited resources, and they've basically given up uh, defending themselves in any kind of serious way uh, that people would expect in Washington and Canberra that a country like New Zealand should. But they've made the calculation quite rightly, in my view, uh, that... Uh, investing huge amounts of money that they don't necessarily have on eye-wateringly expensive uh, military hardware is not something that they can afford to do very easily. Uh, and, you know, more pertinently, perhaps, it's arguably not that necessary. And this is another argument that doesn't get taken terribly seriously at all, because uh, the conventional wisdom is that countries that don't defend themselves or look as if they can defend themselves are going to be vulnerable to being uh, pressured or possibly even invaded in extremists. But, but nobody's been queuing up to invade uh, New Zealand. In fact, they're one of the most secure places on the planet in many ways now. And that's being demonstrated. And they don't have to invest huge amounts in military hardware to uh, maintain that kind of position. So I would argue for what it's worth that there's uh, you know, Australia could do something similar because what's never really considered in these uh, debates is, do we need a brand new fleet of submarines of any sort? Because the reality is that if China is not deterred by the immense military might of the United States, which is still far and away greater than everybody else's, if they're not deterred by the United States, they're not going to be deterred by Australia, whether we buy eight submarines, 12 submarines, or even 20 submarines. It's just not going to make that much difference. And the other problem, of course, is as far as Australia is concerned, if we get locked into buying these uh, new subs from uh, the United Kingdom and the United States, we'll be dependent on their technology, we'll be dependent on their fuel uh, for the nuclear reactors. Uh, and the constraints on Australia's strategic sovereignty will be significantly ramped up and it will be very difficult for Australia to act independently mm -hmm. uh, in violation of the kinds of things that the United States might want to do. And there's a long standing historical track record of the consequences of that kind of uh, strategic dependency on the United States uh, in particular. And yet, interestingly, the Morrison government is not only enthusiastically supporting this policy, but Peter Dutton's been talking about the advantages of 
uh, more American troops in Australia, long-term mm -hmm. strategic bases here. So in some ways, this is a kind of thin end of a wedge of really uh, entrenching that kind of Anglosphere alliance of, uh, of traditional allies yeah. uh, in ways that will lock in Australia to a particular set of uh, relationships and minimize its strategic autonomy. So, and to be and to get back to New Zealand, I think that's what's interesting about New Zealand because they may not be the most powerful country in the world, but they do have a capacity to make some of their own decisions, and they've done so. And it's not uh, jeopardized the security of the country, and they've saved an awful lot of money in the process. And you know, economists talk about opportunity costs that if you spend money on one thing, you can't spend it on something else. And that's a decision that we have to think about in Australia as well, because if we're ever going to be serious about uh, restructuring our domestic economy along sustainable lines, which is debatable uh, altogether in this country, of course, but if we were serious about it, we need a bit of money to do that. And if we're spending it on subs and a new generation of fighter planes, then we don't have that money potentially to spend on that, other things. It actually brings me to my next question. I wanted to ask you about the fallout, if you forgive the pun. Um, for people here in Australia, you and I are both old enough to remember the Cold War with Russia, the nuclear arms race, um, the formidable anti-nuclear movement in Australia that came out of all that, that was quite a force in this country for some time. Um, if we're going to be building the things in Adelaide, not due for delivery in, what is it, 20 years, Presumably, at some stage, we're going to have to have uranium mining or some sort of nuclear facility here, if nothing, if, if not just a toxic waste dump. Is that correct? Well, it, it, we'll have to wait and see. But you would assume that if they're serious about building uh, a nuclear capacity in Australia, then one thing may lead to another and there may be increasing pressure to use domestic uranium to possibly have uh, nuclear power plants at, at some stage as well, because uh, yeah. there would be there would be a certain uh, synergy between some of these things. I think, and there might be a sort of momentum would build up around it. Now, whatever you think about the debates about nuclear power or or, or energy, I mean, in some ways there are a separate set of questions. But I think you're right to suggest that if we begin to go down that road and we have uh, nuclear powered vessels and we have an em emerging technology capacity uh, developing around that uh, that process, then there would be, I think, greater pressure to do other things. And then all the kind of questions about uh, safety, uh, waste disposal, all those kinds of things uh, might come up as well. So, uh, but I think at this stage, it's just the general strategic lock-in that is the kind of really worrying thing about this particular development. And the fundamental question about whether it's actually necessary uh, in the first place, given the, I mean, the 20-year time lag, presumably we're going to ask the Chinese politely not to invade over the next 20 years because we won't be quite ready. But, I mean, I'm being slightly flippant, but it's the kind of thinking that it isn't really articulated. I mean, if they're so vital, why haven't we got them today might be one reasonable question. And would it make the slightest difference if we did have them today? In my view, it probably wouldn't in any serious kind of way. And if we we're concerned about them hearing the Collins class coming underwater 20 miles away, why announce a nuclear sub 20 years before it's due to be delivered? Well, they, they, the, the thinking, I think, among serious strategic types is that these, these will be better, more efficient, quieter, quicker boats, and they'll be able to stay at sea for a lot longer, so they'll be more quote-unquote effective. But, uh, but again, I, I just don't think. And, and the other point is that amongst uh, serious strategic types who know a lot about the the new developments in anti-submarine warfare. Uh, a lot of people think that in 20 years' time, the sort of basic uh, balance of power between offensive and defensive weapons and those kinds of things will have changed. And these boats might be completely redundant by the time they arrive anyway, and very vulnerable to new, cheap and cheerful anti-submarine technologies. So there's a big question mark about that as well, that by the time they get get here, they might be complete white elephants anyway. So uh, so that's something that doesn't get much of a look in either. So, And there's going to be an you know, 18 months period while we just kind of think about, well, how are we actually going to do this, you know, and, and mm. look at how many we're going to get, how much they're going to cost. So there's a lot of imponderables and the record with dealing with these kinds of things. You mentioned the Collins class, which was a fiasco from the start. <laughs> so the record in this country is not good. And uh, it's hard to have 
confidence that this is going to end well either for a variety of reasons. What do you think of the Morrison government's handling of the whole affair? It wasn't very diplomatic, was it? It wasn't diplomatic. Uh, I don't think it's uh, really been thought through in terms of the longer term implications and even the basic strategic rationale that I've been uh, discussing. But I think it, it kind of feeds into a, a narrative in this country that we're insecure, we're vulnerable, we're dependent on what uh, Bob Menzies famously called great and powerful friends. And if we don't do everything we can to ingratiate ourselves on whoever might be the most powerful uh, country on our side at the time, which happens to be the United States now, of course, if we don't ingratiate ourselves and uh, make sure that they're committed to staying in the region, then we're going to be vulnerable uh, and in a situation of uh, peril. And there's a there's a big debate to be had about that, which doesn't get much of an airing in this country either. But, you know, one of the possibilities is that uh, all of this investment in ingratiating ourselves with the United States and now buying their subs and technology, they may still decide that it's America first and pull out. So that's one possibility. The other possibility is that Donald Trump might get back into office again. Uh, that's not an inconceivable prospect. And if he does, uh, America, Australia will be kind of locked into a new nuclear oriented uh, strategy with the United States, with Donald Trump in the White House. And uh, given what we've heard about uh, Donald Trump's generals being concerned about him uh, completely losing it and threatening to wipe out China, then these are not uh, inconsiderable things to be thinking about. I mean, the, the stakes are fantastically high, as well as the cost, of course. Of course. Speaking of the United Kingdom and Brexit, where do you think Brexit leaves all of this? I mean, all of our alliances with the United States and the United Kingdom have been long-standing, as we all know, but the New World Order sort of changed now. Now that we've had Brexit, we're in a post-Trump era, there's a lot of chest beating in relation to inter-country issues, racial issues, um, xenophobia, the Asia-Pacific region. Do you think all of that has weakened what used to be the traditionally strong alliance between Australia, UK and US, as it's seen by the rest of the world, I mean? Well, I think this is one effort to, this uh, AUKUS is one effort to reconstitute this kind of uh, alliance in a more kind of formal and technologically interconnected way. So I think, but the, the rationale for doing so is kind of interesting to unpack, particularly from a British perspective, because why Britain uh, has sent recently sent an aircraft carrier and a couple of other ships to this part of the world to fly the flag. I mean, this is part of Johnson's narrative about quote unquote global Britain and being a proud independent world power mm. in the aftermath of Brexit and leaving Europe. I mean, I think it's a really uh, slightly pathetic throwback to, uh, you know, 100 years or so at the end of empire. And I think Britain, I mean, in my view is that I don't think they've ever quite come to terms with the fact that they're not a great power mm. anymore and that they're not that consequential and these kind of delusions of grandeur and ability to be able to influence world affairs. I think mm. there's a there's a domestic narrative and audience that that plays well to because I think a lot of people, well, at least half the population clearly wanted to leave the European Union for reasons that they don't didn't fully understand in my view. But, uh, but anyway, they've made that decision now and I think Johnson and other people are desperately trying to demonstrate that uh, this decision, which I think was uh, the greatest uh, example of uh, unnecessary self-harm diplomatically that we've seen for an awful long time, but they're now trying to justify this decision with things like this. We're trying to strike trade deals with countries like Australia, which they didn't get a very good deal, the Brits, I don't think, uh, and uh, with America, and now trying to rekindle this kind of Anglosphere alliance. I think it's uh, a real throwback to a former era. And it's not going to play well, uh, I don't think, in this part of the world either, because a number of Australia's neighbours have commented on the fact that uh, this is only going to fuel a regional arms race. And our ASEAN neighbours are terribly sensitive about the about interference from great powers in what they regard as their part of the world. Uh, and so Britain flying the flag here again in concert with uh, the United States and possibly us is not necessarily going to go down well 
will be reassuring as far as some of our immediate neighbours are concerned in terms of the way they think about security in the region. So, uh, so I think there's a lot of imponderables in this, but I think some of the underlying motivations for it are not convincing and persuasive, to say the least. Not convincing and persuasive at all. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Professor B. Very interesting talking to you. you any last observations you'd like to make, comments you oh, have from the only, Defense Department, if you had the chance? <laughs> no, well, only that what, what, I, what I would suggest is that they need to have more imaginative uh, thinking about the possible role that middle power could play. Because as I mentioned before, it's not in Australia's interest for China or the United States to be throwing away it's their weight around. But I would suggest if Australia wanted to do something useful, why not suggest to the United States and China that they should try to engineer the sort of arms reduction treaties that characterise the Cold War, that even Nixon and Reagan managed to negotiate at the height of the Cold War. So they're not that difficult to achieve if the political will's there. But in this case, uh, they, the money that they save from arms reduction treaties could be used on restructuring their domestic economies on environmentally sustainable lines. So that would be precisely the sort of win-win uh, outcome that Xi Jinping's always going on about. Uh, and it would probably be pretty popular with their domestic populations. And it would certainly be a big improvement uh, on their environmental outcomes. But these are the kind of ideas and suggestions that don't get even an airing in Canberra and Washington and probably Beijing for that matter. So that's the kind of challenge that I think we face in trying to uh, develop a new discourse around these kind of strategic issues and get different people uh, making a contribution to this kind of discussion. So it's not just dominated by pointy-headed strategic types in Canberra and Washington, who all think in exactly the same kind of way. Whatever problem comes up, let's buy some more guns and bombs because that's the way to make sure that we're secure. And in the meantime, countries burning down and or flooding and or uh, becoming environmentally unsustainable. And that's the, that's the challenge to change, I think. It's a challenge of the age for all of us, isn't it? Yeah.